I'm so excited to be introducing Dr. Oye Tsundun Wafolabi. He's a consultant pediatrician and head of department pediatrics, Buhari General Hospital, Abuja. She has over 15 years experience in childcare and advocacy with focus on neonatology, general pediatrics and adolescent health. She's also a specialist in childhood nutrition with postgraduate certificate university. Her passion remains using her clinical expertise in the timely intervention and management of common childhood illness. Level and better health outcomes for Nigerian children. Next slide, please. Please, with a clap of hand, let's welcome Dr. Oyetsudo Afolabi to take us on management of common skin conditions in newborns and infants. If there's anything, I think everyone needs to be attentive because everyone can relate to one issue or the other. Dr. Oyetsudo Afolabi, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can all hear me. Good afternoon, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I'll just get straight to it. I'm also excited to be here to discuss about um, some of the very, very common things that um, make our mommies bring their babies to us in the pediatric clinic. And I'm sure it's something that um, a lot of people can relate to. Even our fathers in the room <laughs> can relate to some of the skin conditions that we tend to see in our newborns and infants. So I'm basically here to talk about the ones we commonly see and how we manage them. Next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to start with the outline and this is basically to introduce the topic, the common skin disorders that we see in newborns and infants. I will talk briefly about the anatomy of the skin, which will form like a basis of the discussion. And then obviously I'll move to how we we'll classify some of these um, skin conditions. And thereafter, go to the meat of the matter, discussing the common childhood skin conditions that we usually encounter in our clinics and how we manage them. And then a short note on diaparash, which is something I'm sure a lot of our mothers will be interested in. And thereafter conclude and then go for questions and answers. Next slide. Okay, so by way of introduction, the human skin is the outer covering of the body and is the largest body organ. Well, I'm sure we are all familiar with organs, but we, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with our internal organs. We know about the liver, we know about kidneys, the heart, but not many people realize that our skin is also an organ on its own. And what is an organ essentially is just formed by a collection of body tissues that are joined together to form, you know, is to serve a common function. So our skin essentially consists of all sorts of tissues that, you know, come around and serve the main function of the skin. Now the skin plays a significant role in immunity by protecting against pathogens and preventing excessive water loss. Its other functions include temperature regulation, sensation, insulation, excretion, and synthesis of vitamin D. Uh, um, the major role of the skin is essentially protection. And this is from harmful pathogens. And it's also involved in regulating our body temperature and also permitting sensations of touch, heat, and cold. Um, I'm sure we are familiar with um, the sense organs, okay? Where uh, that skin is one of our sense organs that we use for touch and toxins through sweat. Now, the environmental and endogenous influences inf constantly affect the skin of every individual from infancy to adolescence. And what I'm saying in essence is that the integrity and function of our skin throughout our lifetime could be influenced by the various factors. The, as I was saying, 
the skin of a child has some subtle and you know specific structural and functional features. We make it slightly different from that of an adult. Therefore, it, re it reacts differently to different environmental factors, such as some of the chemicals we apply to it, as well as other hazardous topical preparations. You understand? Next slide. Okay, so this is a schematic representation of the anatomy of the skin. And then um, I would like us to pay close attention to it because it forms the basis of our discussion today. Now, the skin is essentially made up of three layers. We have the epidermis, which is the outer layer. We have the dermis, which is the middle layer, and then the innermost layer, which we call the subcutaneous tissue. As you can see from this slide, the epidermis is the outermost layer and it consists of you know, different cells which make it up. And the features of the epidermis is that it constantly, the cells, there is a, a state of constant cell division, okay? So the epidermis constantly renews itself from the bottom, bottommost part to the outermost part. And the main function of this epidermis is essentially for protection. It acts as a physical barrier against germs and also prevents water loss. It also contains so many cells like the keratinocytes, which um, essentially produce protein, which uh, serves the main function of the protection, as well as melanocytes, which are the pigment cells and are responsible for the color of our skin. The innermost, the middle layer is called the dermis and is essentially a supporting layer which assists in you know, temperature regulation and sensation. You can see that there are so many support structures that are present within the dermis. And this include nerve endings, blood vessels. We have the sweat glands that are responsible for producing sweat, which is which main function is excretion of toxins. And then we also have the oil glands, which we can call seb sebaceous glands. They are also responsible for producing oil and lubricating the skin. Okay, the subcutaneous uh, tissue is the lowermost area, and it's also called the fat layer. And it's mainly responsible for insulation, temperature regulation, and you know, uh, shock, trying to shock stress factors that appear on the skin. Next slide. Okay. Okay, so. As I said, there are some subtle structural and functional differences about uh, that differentiates a child's skin from an adult skin. And then to further buttress the point, we have some skin diseases that seem to have a predilection for children, okay? Now, while we have so many skin lesions that might be mild conditions, we also have a lot of infectious di uh, diseases which can be caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, as well as parasitic infestations. And funny enough, some of these infections can be transmitted from a seemingly healthy adult to a child. And then of course, because of these structural differences, we might have a severe manifestation of this skin disease on the child. Some skin conditions also have hereditary origins. That means it can be um, inherited from parents and this could be Now, the reason why we are concerned about so many skin conditions is that it tends to be distressing to parents. Even though a lot of them tend to be mild, the, due to the cosmetic appearance, it tends to cause some form of distress to the parents. And this is a major reason why we tend to see, you know, parents come around to the clinic to complain about the skin lesions. Another point is that some skin lesions, not all, but some of them can actually be a pointer to an underlying health um, problem. Next slide, please. Next slide. I've already talked about the uh, three layers that the skin is composed of. Okay. Well, some of the differences um, that I need to itemize between a, an infant skin and an adult skin is the fact that obviously we all know that even looking for, uh, at the outward appearance, an infant skin is smoother and softer than that of an adult. Okay, now the outer layer of the infant skin is about 30% thinner than that of the adult. 
And because of the poor reduced water absorption and water holding capacity of a, of a baby skin, they tend to lose water faster than adults, up to five times faster than adults. Of course, an infant skin barrier is also more permeable, so it's more prone to dryness and definitely more vulnerable to a lot of applied substances that, of course, we, the caregivers, our parents, we apply on it. Therefore, an infant skin is more sensitive to irritation and inflammation than an adult skin and therefore needs extra protection. Next slide. Okay, so I'll just go briefly to talk about the classification of the common childhood skin conditions that we have. Now, I'd like to mention that this is not an exhaustive slide. We common uh, Skin conditions are very vast and there are so many of them. But what I try to do is just to categorize the commonest that we tend to see in our everyday practice. Now, the first category is the benign neonatal skin conditions. And you can see we have four. In, the, in this category that I'm going to talk about. I will take them in detail, so I don't want to waste time. The other category is the eczema, which other people call dermatitis. And under it, we also have its categories. I'll pick one or two that we commonly see. Of course, as I said, we have bacterial uh, infectious origin of skin disorders, which could be bacterial. Next slide. Could be fungal and this mainly the superficial fungi infection. It could even be of viral origin, where you see cases like chicken pox or happy simplex. The commonest parasitic infection we tend to see in our everyday practice is scabies. And then we have a, the miscellaneous group where you have, you know, birth marks, autoimmune disorders, and ichthyosis, which is the fish skin disease. I may not be able to talk about all these conditions, but I'll pick the commonest and then we'll discuss them in detail. Next slide. Okay, so we'll get, we've get gotten to the meat of the matter now where we talk about the common childhood skin conditions and how they are managed. Next. Okay, so the first category are the benign neonatal skin conditions. And under this, I will first talk about the erythema toxicum neonatorum. Now, the name sounds very, <laughs> I would say, is it toxic now? But the truth of the matter is that the condition itself is the complete opposite of how this um, title looks. The name given to the skin lesion sounds so scary, but the skin lesion itself is a very mild and benign skin lesion. It's a harmful baby rash that occurs in more than 50% of babies that we born in our environment. Now, the rash typically appears on the second to third day of life. So babies are not born with the rash most of the time. And the easiest way I can describe this rash is that it looks like insect bites, you know, small ant bites on the skin surface where you find a little whitish to yellowish pimple-like bump, okay? And then it's just surrounded by red blotches, okay? It can occur anywhere on the skin surface except the palms and the soles. And as I've said, it's a very mild condition. It's, uh, it doesn't present with any symptoms like itching or pain. It's not infectious in nature. And the truth is we don't even know the cause. In this case, a lot of times when the parents come, the parents are even more distressed than the baby because apart from the appearance, the baby doesn't have any symptoms. Baby feeds well, no fever, no issues. So what we do is just parental reassurance. No treatment is required and it will disappear by one to two weeks of age. Next slide. So this is a typical diagrammatic representation of what I was talking about. I'm sure a lot of us can relate to some of these um, appearances in a newborn baby, two, three day old to five day old baby. And you just see these reddish blotches on the baby's skin, okay? It's not itchy, non-painful, and the baby feeds well, no fever, no issues. So this is how it looks. Appears anywhere on the skin surface, and this is the typical uh, presentation. Next. Now, the second type I would like to discuss is the transient neonatal postular melanosis, another very scary, long-looking name. But actually, it's also a very mild, harmless skin condition. Now, it has some subtle differences between the erythema toxicum neonatorum. And the subtle differences are, is that it is always present at birth. Remember, I said the other one usually typically occurs two, three days after birth. But the TMPM, 
is a very harmless condition that you will find at birth. Now, the presentation looks more like very tiny fluid filled um, um, skin elevation rashes, which we call vesicles. Some might look a little bit pus like filled, which we call postules, okay? And any area of the body may be involved, including the soles and the palms. Okay, now these lesions, the vesicles and postules, they rupture easily and resolve within like two, two days. Once they rupture, it leads, it leaves um, like a hyperpigmented um, rash, you know, a macro, a hyperpigmented spots on the skin, okay, which might last for several months. As I said, TMPM is self-limiting, is benign. It doesn't have any issues. Baby doesn't have any issues. Feeding well, no fever, no issues. And therefore, management is essentially parental reassurance because it is going to disappear over the next couple of months. Next. Okay, so this is how TMPM looks like. You can see on the baby's face and on the baby's hand in the slide on the left. On the baby's hand, you will see that some of these fluid field uh, lesions, they've already ruptured and they just left like some darkened uh, spots on the baby's skin. Okay, the one on the right is still intact and they've not ruptured yet, but this is typically how it looks. And I said, as I said earlier, it's harmless and you know it will tend to resolve over the next couple of months. So we don't apply anything and we just um, reassure the parents when they bring such babies. Next. Okay, another benign harmless skin condition that we've seen in newborns is what we call milia. And milia, we otherwise know, know it as a milk spot, okay? It's also very common in our newborns. It occurs in up to 40% of them, and it is also present at birth. Now, it presents like tiny white pinhead bumps that occur typically on the face, and it's due to some of the oil ducts that I talked about in the middle layer of the skin, they get blocked. And then because of that, there's some accumulation of oil and then it just looks like milk spots on the face. Common, It's common around the nose and cheek area, although it can be found on the forehead and chin. Now, now these pinhead bumps are not infected and they also disappear in another one or two months of it. Again, no treatment is required and we just reassure parents. Next slide. So a lot of these conditions, especially in the newborn, are just conditions that, you know, would resolve on the common in our environment because, you know, we are in the tropic region where the weather is mostly hot and humid. Now, it can occur in any age group, but then it's commoner in newborns due to the tiny pores that the newborn has, which is slightly different from the adults. And this, of course, their pores being tinier gets easily irritated and blocked. Now, some of the precipitating factors that worsen heat rash in babies is what we tend to apply. Body skin ointments, excessive clothing, you know, excessive warming in incubators for the preterms, you know, where there's so much heat, it tends to aggravate heat rash. And there are different forms of this heat rash, depending on the level of injury to the sweat gland. Next so slide. So as I said, miliaria called heat rash can present in different forms. So you can see the, the one on the left side, the miliaria pristia. This presents like um, vesicles. That is small fluid field, okay, elevations on the skin, rashes on the skin. And this is when the sweat glands are blocked at the uppermost layer of the skin. So as I... As you can see, they are clear, they are small, they are superficial vesicles, and there's no form of inflammation. That's why you can't see any red knee. The lesions are, you know, they don't present with symptoms, no itching, and they tend to rupture. They are also very sterile. Now, the second type is the miliaria rubra, and this occurs when the sweat gland obstruction occurs deeper within the skin. This tends to, this is the typical heat rash that a lot of us know that comes with um, you know, rashes, raised, uh, raised elevations in the skin, and you have the sensation of prickling, burning, or tingling. It is also extremely itchy. So this is one of the variants that we commonly see in um, children. Next slide. 
We have some other variants of uh, malaria, malaria, which is postulosa. In this group, they tend to present with uh, pus field lesions, as you can see on the left. Okay, so you have itchy pus like lesions, although the pus, the pus within the rashes tend to be sterile. Okay, but then they look pus like. And then you can see on the right hand side the more severe one, which is malaria profunda. Okay. And they tend to present like flesh colored, you know, elevations of the skin. Although in this particular variant, they are non itchy. Okay, so next slide. So I'm just showing us the different ways by rash can present. Now, in terms of management, heat rash usually respond, uh, resolves spontaneously within a few weeks. Prevention is key. And um, you know, as, as it just essentially involves avoidance of excessive hot and humid conditions. And we can do this by obviously moving to a cooler environment, avoiding sweat provoking activities, avoiding excessive or occlusive clothing, especially for our babies, and then frequent cool showers. And um, one thing I notice with um, our parents that bring in our babies with heat rash is that people tend to forget that our babies too are human beings. So during the hot weather, when we, the adults are feeling hot, they are also feeling hot. But irrespective of the weather, you will see our mummies overclothing babies, wearing sweaters, wearing three, four layers of clothing. And this is uh, essentially what predisposes to heat rashes. So some of the treatment options, you know, I talked about having four different clinical presentation. The more severe types, we tend to use steroid creams because they, there is some element of inflammation. The ones that have itching, you know, I talked about the common one that um, um, usually presents with itching. We use calamine lotion and some other lotions, lotions that can be used to prevent itching. And then the ones that have some level of um, um, bacterial super infection, like the profunda, the malaria profunda, we tend to use the anti cream antibiotics like fusidic acid and mopirosin calcium. Next. But essentially, once we apply the general measures to avoid being in a hot and humid environment, it tends to disappear on its own. Now to the next major group that I'm going to talk about, it's eczema or what some other people call dermatitis. Now I know that um, eczema is a very, very common term. It is what is used for any skin eruption, any skin lesion by the layman. And you can see that eczema and dermatitis, well, they are used interchangeably and they are generic terms for skin inflammation. But the difference between eczema and dermatitis is that eczema is a form of dermatitis, meaning it just describes a group of skin lesions which, in which the skin is itchy, the skin is dry, and the skin is inflamed. Now, dermatitis is a more encompassing term, a broader term that you know, describes different skin conditions that involve inflammation of the skin. So for clarity purposes, I would just say all eczema are dermatitis, but not all dermatitis are eczema. So I don't know if uh, we have uh, are following me. Next slide. Now, the commonest form of um, eczema or dermatitis now that we see in our children is atopic dermatitis. Now, atopic dermatitis, chronic meaning long inflammatory skin condition. Now, the main feature of atopic dermatitis is that it's a long lasting condition, not something that occurs within, within a few days or weeks and stop. Long lasting and it tends to come on and off, you know, periods they are periods of resolution of okay. It affects close to twenty in adults. See it only in about one two percent. So what this just means is that a lot of the children that tend to have eventually outgrow um, the condition and. It starts usually within the first uh, six months of life in up to 50%, almost half of children that will have it. And most of them, if they will have atopic dermatitis, would have had it before five years of age. 
another very key thing about atopic dermatitis is the fact that in most cases, there is a family history of atopy. By atopy, atopy, I mean allergic disorders, such as asthma, allergic rhinitis. A lot of them have family history as you know, allergic conjunctivitis. And then the cause of atopic dermatitis is not from one source, but it's like an interplay of many factors, such as the immune system, you know, genetic factors where you have to inherit, you know, some of these hereditary factors from the parents and also environmental triggers. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so how do, how does atopic dermatitis, how does it usually present? It's very common in infants now, our newborns and children less than one year, very commonly affects the face, that's around the cheek area, the neck, the extensor surfaces of the arms and the legs in the infant. You can see the diagrammatic representation of what I'm talking about. So what I mean by extensor surfaces are the skin covering the joint areas, either the elbow joint or the knee joint, helping stretching our arms, okay. These are the find atopic dermatitis. Older children, you can find these skin lesions on the opposite side of the knee joint or elbow joint, where we call flexural, flexural areas, okay? And one typical thing with atopic dermatitis is that it usually spares the armpits and the diaper regions. As you can see from the diagram, that the diaper region seems to be clear, as well as the armpit region. So if you see, for example, we are still going to talk about diaper rash. If you see a diaper rash, is is not likely to be atopic dermatitis. Next slide. Okay, so you can see the pictures of what I described. You can see typically that the skin is high. On the cheek regions, on the knee, on the elbows, you can see how the skin uh, typically looks. And it's, you see some flaky lesions, you see itchy, it's itchy lesions, patches and different um, forms of, of crust and um, elevation of the skin. Next slide. This is another uh, diagrammatic representation I said, another baby. Next slide. Okay, so what are the common triggers? The common triggers, are the chemical irritants that we tend to use in the house, like soaps, all these medicated soap, shampoos, detergents using in washing the clothes of our babies, perfumes used, household cleaners, and then physical irritants, like the kind of clothes that we wear for the babies. There are some fabrics that are rough and scratchy like wool, and this can trigger atopic dermatitis. Inhaled allergens like dust, pollen, mold, animal dander. Some of these things that trigger asthma, in adults or even older children are typically the things that trigger atopic dermatitis. So you can see a link between allergic conditions and atopic dermatitis. Some food allergens too, like eggs, peanuts, milk, fish, or seafood, and even food additives like gluten, soy that they put in food, as well as wheat can trigger atopic dermatitis. Now, environmental changes in temperature and humidity. When we have hot, humid weather, can trigger and in case there is sweating, it can trigger atopic dermatitis as well as underlying skin infections. Next, please. So as I said, the clinical features that stand atopic dermatitis out from other skin lesions is itching. Once there is no itching, know that that skin lesion is not atopic dermatitis. That's and some lesions are not so well defined. You can see associated redness, um, oozing, okay? And because it's an extremely itchy condition, once you keep on itching, skin break the intention for fungus. They tend to have, and this is when you have um, um,
Next slide. Okay, so how do we, um, I said, most of the lab laboratory tests do not, um, um, are not specific tests that would make you diagnose atopic dermatitis. So what we base our diagnosis on is basically clinically, the patient's history, the fact that it's a, a, cheeky, a very itchy condition, the skin is dry, there's a positive family history of um, allergy, and the way the the skin lesions okay are you hearing me now yes dr falabi you can hear you okay all right so as i've said diagnosis mainly clinical based on on the baby's history the way the lesions look the positive family history and the hallmark features itching dryness and inflammation Next slide. Okay, so modalities of treatment essentially is to avoid the triggers that we mentioned and then minimizing itching and inflammation. You can do this by using topical steroids, uh, steroid creams, you can use moisturizers, you can use antihistamines. Okay, for the topical immunomodulators, we don't use it for our young children. Is for older children, so I won't really talk about that. For cases where you have superimposed bacterial infections, you might go as far as going for the oral antibiotics or the uh, topical antibiotics. Next slide. Okay, so how do we avoid trigger factors? These are things that we can do at the family level at home. And it's essentially ensuring that the, ba the baby's skin is not excessively dry. There are some actions that we take at home. Young babies, we tend to bath them too frequently and with hot water. In some climes, the hot water they use for hot massage for the mother, they will leave for the baby so that they can massage the baby's skin too. So this excessive and frequent hot baths, excessive scrubbing of the baby's skin, toiling after baths, they tend to dance on the skin and cause excessive drying. So these kind of actions, we must avoid them. Another thing we can do to ensure that the skin is not too dry is to add bathing, um, soothing bath oils to the water, okay? And then when we, after our bathing, we just dry by patting and not by rubbing. Now, there are some cosmetics that we should also try and avoid. All cosmetics, cleansers, body oils, and lotions that contain lalonine. Lalonine is a skin sensitizer. It happens to be an emollient, but it's a skin sensitizer that tends to cause allergies and it aggravates atopic dermatitis. Another thing we must avoid is to avoid extremes of weather, especially hot weather that can cause sweating because this can trigger, you know, atopic dermatitis. And of course, I talked about the scratchy um, fabrics like wool that we should avoid it. And it's better to use comfortable clothes that are made of cotton. And then in when there is a history of allergy in the family, it's better not to keep household pets, as well as furry toys and floor rugs. Any form of allergen that you think can trigger the skin infection, like dust, pet dander, also has to be eliminated from the household. Next slide, please. Okay, so a key thing that we must do in ensuring that the skin isn't excessively dry is to ensure adequate moisturization of the skin. The baby has to take a lot of water. For those that are less than six months, I did not say add water to breast milk. Breast milk is essentially 80 to 90% of water. So therefore, exclusive breastfeeding will do the work. Now, for those that are older, they can take a pl a plenty of water that could add moisture and hydration to the skin. Now, a daily warm bath, not hot bath, just warm bath for about 15 to 20 minutes will also help moisturize the skin and make it less itchy. And of course, there are some bathing soaps that are found to be non, that are not harsh, okay? They are moisturizing soaps and are pH balance. At the risk of um, promoting brands, I, I'll just mention a few that are common in the market. A lot of us know Dove soap. 
it's a moisturizing soap. So those kind of soaps can be used to bath instead of medicated soaps that are very harsh. And then it's also good to apply moisturizers or emollients within a few minutes after bathing. Now, moisturizers and emollients are about the same thing. The moisturizer is used to add moisture to the skin and they're essentially moisturizing creams. Again, you see Dove, Nivea, all sorts of moisturizing creams. While emollients are used to soften the skin and help trap water uh, over the skin. So the common ones that uh, we see around are the shea butter, cocoa butter, and sometimes uh, Vaseline. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, the next one I would like to talk about is infantile seborrheic dermatitis. Now, seborrheic dermatitis is a skin rash that occurs in areas where you have high oil gland concentration, which is also called sebaceous gland. So you see it on the scalp, you see it on the face, in the armpits, on the trunk, and even the diaper regions. This is what makes it different from atopic dermatitis. It's commonly occurs where you have these glands that produce oil and the groin area, that is the diaper region, is one of them. So if you see a diaper rash, it could be a seborrheic dermatitis, but never an atopic dermatitis. Now, seborrheic dermatitis is typically associated with yeast infections, which are fungal infections. And, you know, research has also shown that the baby could have some form of impaired immune reaction. That's why they tend to have it. Now, it occurs within six weeks of life and tend to last for months. Now, these skin lesions are also asymptomatic, meaning they are harmless. They tend to be beefy red and sharply demarcated without any elevation of the skin, okay? And this, the rash tends to spread to adjacent areas because as I said, it's associated with fungal infection. So, you know, it tends to spread to other areas. And as I said, the skin is unbroken, it's uh, harmless. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a pictorial representation of what I'm saying. You know, I said it happens, the lesions occur where there are sweat glands, a lot of um, oil glands. So you see it in the axillary region, see it in the groin region. And then there's a clinical presentation that you see on the scalp, which they call cradle cap. And this refers to the scale crusting type. You can see it in the picture and it appears like white or yellow scales. Very common in a lot of our newborns that we tend to see. Next slide, please. Okay, so management, again, mainly clinical. We don't tend to do tests. It's based on the history, how the lesions look. And we tend to recommend combination therapy for it. Remember I said that it's associated with um, fungal infection. So we tend to use very low dose corticosteroid cream. And then we also use antifungal creams such as ketoconazole, meconazole, which can be applied. Now for the cradle cap, which occurs on the scalp, we tend to use shampoos, which might contain zinc. A common brand is head and shoulders or ketoconazole um, shampoo. Misoral shampoo is another common brand that we tend to use and it helps you know, remove the cradle cap. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'll be moving to the bacterial infection and a common entity under bacterial infection is impetigo. Now, impetigo is a very highly contagious superficial pyogenic skin infection, highly infectious. The main clinical forms are the non-bullous impetigo, bullous impetigo, and eczema. And it tends to also occur in warm weather. So it's common in our environment. Where you see overcrowding, poverty, poor hygiene, and those that have pre existing skin lesions. So for example, those that have atopic dermatitis that have been itching the skin and have breached the integrity of the skin, they could have a superimposed bacterial infection and an impetigo over that. So it can occur in those with pre-existing skin condition. And it can also occur in previously healthy babies. So the lesions are usually found on this face and then it now spreads to other parts of the body. And just as I said, it's highly contagious. So the lesions can spread easily through touch or through the clothing. Now we tend to discourage because while you are trying to rub Vaseline on the lesion, it tends to spread of the lesions and makes it worse. 
Okay, so one of the clinical forms of non bullous impetigo that we tend to see in children and even adults is the commonest form of impetigo. And the cause is a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus, or could also be caused by another called Staphylococcus pyogenes. As I said, commonly affects infants, young children, and even adults. Now you can see the picture that I attached to the slide. It tends to form as fluid field uh, or post field elevations of the skin, which will rupture and then now start um, evolving to gold crusted plaques with a red mean base. So you can see this around the lips of this child. They don't tend to have any other systemic symptoms like fever. This, all you see are just the skin lesions. We do otherwise. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, non bullous in the tiger, I've talked about uh, that. Next slide. Okay, the bullous impetigo is the one caused by um, toxin producing Staphylococcus aureus. And this is the one that tends to affect uh, more of our newborns and infants. Okay, I can't see the picture coming up, but what uh, it typically presents as very thin walled, uh, fluid or pus filled lesions. Okay. And they tend to look clear. <laughs> Typical surrounding um, redness uh, is absent, unlike what you find in non bullous impetigo. And the, the child may have fever, although the lymph nodes surrounding that area doesn't seem to be affected. Okay, I don't think we have, um, there should be a picture attached to that slide. Okay, I think we can see the picture now. This is what we tend to see in bullous impetigo. And as I as I've described, thin world fluid field or pus field lesions that look yellow, clear with slightly turbid food. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the last form and the most severe form is what they call ectima. And it, it's the most severe form of the impetigo, clinical forms of impetigo. And it's a deeper form of impetigo where you have an, an adherent crust underlying ulceration. And these ulcers appear punched out on the baby's skin. This occurs with the lymph nodes around that area also being affected. And the child might also have um, systemic features like um, fever. Next, please. Okay, so management also clinical. Most in most cases, we don't tend to use lab tests to diagnose it. But um, in petigo, for the mild ones, tend to be self-limiting. But by the time you use antibiotics, either alone the uh, the cream antibiotics or the oral antibiotics, it tends to decrease the duration and spread of these skin lesions. So the cream antibiotics that we tend to use are the mupirocin, fusidic acid. For which is used as first line treatment. While we can use systemic antibiotics in addition, the oral antibiotics for the more severe forms of impetigo. Other general measures, you know, I said it's a very contagious um, disease. So, other general measures that we tend to do is to ensure good personal hygiene, frequent washing of clothing and beddings, and of course, avoiding direct contact with lesions. Next slide. Okay, the superficial fungal infections are next, and I'll just be talking of one under this category because there are different forms. But the one that is commonest is the one that are caused by the dermatophyte um, fungi. Okay, and these are the infections they call tinea infections. Now, tinea can occur in any part of the body, and we name the infection depending on the area of the body where it occurs. So if the infection occurs on the body itself, we call it tinea corporis. If it occurs on the head, we call it tinea capitis. If it occurs on the foot, tinea pedis and so on. Next slide, please. 
So I'll be talking mainly about the one that we tend to see more in infants, and this is tinea capitis. Now, tinea capitis or scalp ringworm is an infection of the scalp and hair shafts, and is also characterized by itchy, scaly, and bald patches on the head. Now, the common organisms that cause tinea capitis are trichophyton and microsporum species, and it is also a very infectious um, infection. It may be transmitted in the barbing saloon from person to person and via usage of combs, usage of hats, even the beddings. And the lesions tend to first occur as um, elevations, red elevations of the skin, and then later progress as grayish ring-shaped scaly patches on the skin. And a lot of, if not most of the time, whenever you see tinea, wherever there is infection, there will be associated hair loss in the infected areas. Because it is also quite itchy, bacterial superinfection can occur while you know the skin is breached due to frequent itching. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are different clinical forms of um, tinea capitis. You can see on the left, the type that they call gray patch. It just affects a circumscribed area of the head and you can see the surrounding alopecia. It can also present as a form of diffuse scaly lesions, which we typically call dandruff. Next slide. Both these uh, conditions tend to be non-inflammatory. And then the next forms are the more severe and inflammatory forms. And one is called flavus. You can see the way it's already looking that it looks, it looks uh, inflammatory with superimposed infection. Now, the diagnosis is primarily clinical as well, but there are some lab tests that can um, identify these um, fungi organisms, such as the microscope examination, other potassium hydroxide, and wood lamp examination, as well as PCR. Next slide, please. How do we manage tinea capitis? The first line treatment is oral grossiofluvin, which is an antifungal agent. It's an older agent which it has to be taken orally and for a very long period of time, up to three months therapy. But now we have newer oral antifungal agents that are equally effective and safe and have shorter treatment courses for four months, four weeks rather, like the ketoconazole, tebinafin, and the other family. Now, as an adjunct, we tend to use ketoconazole 2% shampoo on the scalp to eradicate carrier state and ensure that it reduces the tendency to spread to others. The antifungal creams are not usually encouraged because the relapse rate tends to be high, but it can be used as an adjunct alongside other um, treatment that I mentioned earlier to reduce itching and improve the appearance of the lesions. Next, please. Okay, now um, I'll be talking about scabies, which is the only entity that will talk about under parasitic infections. Scabies is one of the commonest parasitic infestations that we see in, in children, and it's caused by a mite cause, called Scacoptes scabi. It is highly contagious, highly pruritic, pruritic, I mean itching, and it can spread through personal contacts and, and through clothing and, you know, um, person can, it can easily spread from person to person. So whenever we treat scabies, it, it tend, there's a tendency that we are treating a whole household or even a whole community having scabies. This is how infectious it is. So it also presents like small red crusty bumps, which can now progress to form fluid field lesions or post field lesions, okay? As I said, the hallmark of scabies is itching, which is, tend which is severe at night and then tends to cause a lot of scratch marks and uh, damage the integrity of the skin and then cause a secondary bacterial infections. We tend to see the lesions usually between the fingers, on the sides of the hands and feet, inner wrists, the armpits, even the diaper regions, you can get scabies there. But in our very young children, we tend to see it more on the palms, the soles, the head and neck, and of course, also the diaper regions. Next slide, please. Okay, so you can see the pictures. 
on this uh, on the sole of this baby you can see how the lesions look and the other side okay so i guess we are going <laughs> okay now next slide please okay so management of scabies is essentially using 5% permethrin cream which you apply on the body surface for 8 to 12 hours and then you wash it off this can be done twice, leaving a week interval before the treatment. Other treatment that we don't use for our infants, but we tend to use for older children and adults, include benzyl, benzoate, and sulfur ointment. Now, because I said it's a intensely itchy condition, we tend to use antihistamines and calamine lotion that will help with the itching. And then, of course, steroid creams can be used to reduce inflammation. When there's secondary infection, we treat with antibiotics. And it is also key to treat all the close contacts of a particular index and um, patient. So whenever we see a child that we've diagnosed to have um, scabies, we will treat the whole family because 90% of cases, it must have come from either a family member or um, a neighbor, somebody around. So we tend to treat all the contacts of the babies. And of course, linens, beddings, clothing must be washed and air dried for at least a day as at the time of treatment, so as to avoid reinfection and spread. Next slide. Okay, so we are gradually getting to the end. The miscellaneous group that I would love to talk about are the birth marks. We tend to have different birth marks and there's hardly a family where you have a child that doesn't have one form of birth mark or the other. So it's quite common. Birth marks are colored marks on the skin that appear at birth or or soon afterwards. And it can be classified as pigmented lesions, which occur with the pigment cells, vascular lesions, which occur with the blood vessels, or epidermal nevi, which occur with the outer layer of the skin. Most of birth marks that we see are harmless and they tend to fade away. Some fade away, like the Mongolian spots, while some might be present for life, like port wine stain. And occasionally, a birth mark might be a sign of an underlying serious condition, like a neurocutaneous syndrome. Next, please. Okay, so these are the pigmented lesions I talked about, Mongolian spots. As you can see, I'm sure a lot of our mothers would identify this picture on the left. It's very, very common. Babies that are born with Mongolian spots, they tend to occur due to proliferation of the pigment cells. That's why they are darker and they vary in shape, size, location. They tend to be present at birth or some may, may appear shortly after birth. And they are very, very common around the back uh, region, back book talk region. They tend to fade away by two to three years of age. So it's a very harmless condition. We just um, reassure parents. And as I said, it fades away in a couple of years. Some, you might see the trace up to adult life, but as I said, it tends to fade away and it portends no danger at all to the baby. The other one next to it by the right is a melanocytic nevi, and it tends to, similar to Mongolian spots, but they usually contain excessive hair. They tend to be darker and they do not disappear. Although they may lighten over... Now, one thing with melanocytic nevi is that for those that are very big, because as I said, they vary in size, shape, you know, and location. Those that are very big, like for the one that we are seeing in the picture, they have to be monitored because there is like a 10% lifetime risk of the lesion developing cancer in later life. So for them, they tend to be monitored so that they'll be sure that, of course, the child doesn't later on develop cancer, that skin cancer, melanoma in adult life. Next slide, please. You know, I said we have vascular lesions too, and these lesions typically occur from, uh, originate from blood vessels. On the left, we have hemangiomas. You can see that they, are they appear like bright reddish strawberry bumps on the skin, and it's essentially made up of extra blood vessels. They usually occur within the first, they, they don't appear at best, at best most of the time. They occur within the first two months of life and they tend to increase in size over the first year of life and then start gradually shrinking. So by the time the child is about 10 years of age, they tend to disappear. 
they are very, very common on the face, on the scalp, on the chest region, and on the back. Now, the complications they tend to have is because, you know, as I said, parental anxiety. Once you see such a skin lesion that a child is typically not born with, they tend to start applying chemicals and stuff, and this may lead to ulceration and bleeding. Again, if it's located at an area where there is constant friction on the skin, maybe it's, if it's located around the armpit region, for example, it can cause the friction can cause ulceration and can lead to bleeding. But they are usually left untreated, except in few cases where they occur where it um, obstructs function. For example, a, a hemangioma that occurs on the eyelid that is blocking vision or something, then something has to be done about it. Now, the one on the right is the port wine stain. And this is exactly how, how it looks. It's not a raised lesion. It just appears like a reddish purplish skin discoloration. And unlike the hemangioma that um, tends to occur after, right, the port wine stain always appears at birth. 100% of the time, you see it at birth. And it is a permanent skin uh, mark, a uh, birth mark, rather. It does not fade away. Most are harmless, but a few can be associated with um, some syndromes, medical conditions, for example, Stoddweber syndrome. But of the port wine stain, it's typically located on the face and the neck regions, just as you can see on this baby. So it's very, because of the cosmetic appearance, it tends to be very distressing to our parents and our, okay, to our parents. And of course, it might warrant them seeking some form of intervention. But otherwise, most of the time is um, um, a harmless lesion. Next slide, please. Epidermal, nerval, are just excessive growth of the outer layer of the skin, the epidermis. And this is how we say tends to look as you know darkish bumps that may appear at birth or early childhood again they vary in shape size location and you know they're harmless too it's, except for cosmetic reasons people don't really bother about them and you know but of course if it's so much of a concern it could be removed surgically but people tend to leave and they also tend to be present for life they don't disappear next please Okay, so the last entity that I'll be talking about is the diaper rash. And I know this is a very common entity that a lot of our mothers have to contend with. So it has so many names, diaper rash, diaper dermatitis, nappy rash, nappy napkin, dermatitis, all sorts of names. It's one of the commonest skin issues that we see in our pediatric clinic amongst infants. Now, the diaper rash is not a single entity. And it uh, typically refers to different forms, different conditions that just happen to affect the diaper region. So apart from atopic dermatitis that I talked about earlier that doesn't usually present in the groin area, any other skin conditions, the seborrheic dermatitis, candidiasis, um, can affect contact dermatitis, can affect the diaper region. And these are all lumped together as a diaper rash. So for, because there is this prolonged moisture in that diaper area, there is the tendency of a secondary bacteria and fungal infection that might develop. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are the main factors that contribute to a diaper rash? What's the constant skin irritation from urine and baby pube due to infrequent diaper change, frequent diaper rubbing and friction? When the diaper is soaked, and you know it keeps on rubbing on the baby's skin it tends to irritate the baby's skin so this is one of the very very common cause of diaper rash another um, contributory factor is an allergic reaction to baby foods laundry detergents baby wipes and other baby products even baby food um, all sorts then as i said um, fungal infections are common in that area because of the prolonged moisture also bacterial infection now, a common uh, research uh, point is that clothes diapers tend to predispose more to diaper rash as against disposable diapers because a disposable diaper tends to absorb better the way, you know, the, the, uh, the diapers are manufactured. Now, they tend to absorb better and some even have a protective lining that separates the baby's skin mm -hmm. from contact from, you know, urine and poo. So it tends to prevent or at least minimize diaper, diaper rash as against using a cloth. 
for a diaper. Of course, we've talked about so many skin diseases and they are linked with the immune status. So babies with impaired immune status, like those that have protein, energy, malnutrition, HIV, AIDS, they tend to have diaper rash or are predisposed to diaper rash. There's this um, entity called zinc deficiency too that can predispose to diaper rash. And of course, diaper rash can, can, just as I said, can be a part of other skin infections and um, disorders. Next slide. Uh, okay, so one of the commonest forms of, of diaper rash that we see back, if we can go back, is the back. Back, please. No, we've not got in the, okay, stop here. So one of the commonest forms that we see is the irritant contact dermatitis. And as I said, it is essentially when the skin is in contact with urine or baby pool due to infrequent diaper change. And you, as you can see, it's well, it's a well demarcated rash. It doesn't spread because it's not infectious in nature. And it tends to, uh, to spare the tie creases and limited to the diaper area. Now it tends to respond to routine treatment I'm going to talk about what we can do to just prevent it since it's not typically infectious. Next. Okay, for candidiasis, that's having a fungal infection, you can see that apart from other parts of the body, it can affect the diaper region because of that extra moisture that the diaper region tends to provide. And it tends to spread to the adjacent regions, which we call satellite, satellite lesions. And then it also involves the inner type, that is the creases of the skin. It does not respond to routine treatment. Whether you change your diapers frequently or not, you must use antifungal agents to ensure that um, it's eventually uh, treated. Next slide. Okay, thank okay, you very I much, said, Ma. Uh, we have a few more uh, minutes left, Ma. So yes, I'm almost done. I have just like two or three more slides left. Okay, so as I said, diaper rash can be a form of, um, as part of other clinical conditions. I've talked about bullous impetigo. I've talked about seborrheic dermatitis. Next slide, please. Okay, other systemic conditions like psoriasis, zinc deficiency, tends to present like this in diaper rash. Next slide. So I'll just talk briefly on the management, what we can do to ensure that we prevent, uh, minimize children having diaper rashes. And the key thing is ensuring that the diaper is dry and clean. And this can be done by increased frequency of diaper changing, ensuring that the area is cleaned with warm water and use a neutral soap that would avoid allergies. The diaper area should be dried and you can put simple protective cream, you know, that would then lessen the irritation of the skin use of disposable diapers and, are wearing, and also wearing appropriate diapers that are not too tight. Next, please. Obviously, we should avoid other things that can cause allergies like irritant products, allow diaper-free periods. Once the baby pulls or urinates and you clean up, allow the baby to air dry, that area to air dry a little. And then obviously, when you see anything around the diaper region that keeps, it makes you worried, see a specialist for proper treatment. Other, you treat the underlying cause, depending on whatever causes the diaper rash, you use the appropriate therapy. So proper diagnosis of the specific cause is key. I think the next slide is the conclusion slide. Okay. So in conclusion, skin disorders are a frequent occurrence in infancy and childhood, prompting frequent visits for outpatient consultation. While some are self-limiting and require only parental reassurance, others require specific therapy. Therefore, when in doubt about a diagnosis, it's better to see a specialist. And obviously, appropriate diagnosis and treatment often results on, in great improvement and satisfaction for the patient, caregiver, and obviously the health worker alike. So thank you so much. It's a very, very wide topic. I had to like compress a lot of information, but at least I hope I've been able to get the key elements across. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you.